Welcome. Thank you for having me. No problem. So we were talking like earlier about uh, your PhD and your studies. And um, yeah, I'm just interested. What did you study before you started teaching and doing your company? So you're taking me back now many years. Yes. yes. <laughs> and so the memories are fantastic. I had really a good time studying what I was really passionate about. So my PhD, which was in the University of Sheffield in the UK, um, was about exploring how um, small business owners, entrepreneurs, communicate with each other in small local communities, communities that usually specialize on one industry. This is a, this is a specific model of economic development. It's called industrial districts. And you have areas around the world where the whole town or the whole region is in one industry. For example, making carpets or in Italy making uh, furniture. Yeah. So this is a very specific model of economic development. And because it's uh, of some of its advantages, it's, it's considered a very powerful model for uh, local communities with small businesses to dominate globally. But in order to dominate globally, because they're very small businesses, mm-hmm. they do it collectively, not... Um, one by one or on their own. But in order to do it collectively, they need to exchange information on a basis of trust. But nobody studied before I did it, nobody studied in these so-called industrial districts or clusters, nobody studied really the mechanism, the psychological mechanism, the process by which entrepreneurs in these towns uh, evaluate, they have some kind of mental accounting to evaluate, hmm, David told me this about a potential new market in Latin America. Should I believe him or not? So really, I did the extensive uh, uh, interviews, questionnaires, of course, uh, desktop research around the world. Um, I examined in depth this process of believing and thus trusting some people or not others. But it's even more complex. I trust David for some type of information, but I don't trust him for some other type of information. But in the end, new information that comes outside of these uh, areas, which is crucial for them to sell globally, because they sell globally, they don't sell locally, usually, um, somehow it enters and spreads like fire through the entrepreneurs in order for the right um, st- the strategic partnerships to form uh, intuitively because of the social and cultural relations that people have and create products, create campaigns, create innovation that then makes them successfully globally. So before social media, <laughs> I don't know if you, if you watched the social dilemma. And, uh, yes, it's fantastic. About, yeah, and, and this kind of you know echo chambers and um, spreading of misinformation online because there is a big discussion now: should we trust you know a piece of news or or somebody that shares something in social media? Should we automatically trust it because we see it on social media? And how do we? What is the 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 criteria, what is the process to deconstruct the person, the news, the social media, and then believe or not. So I did this, of course, without social media, um, before the discussion of social dilemma. So really early, I, 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 I kind of took a good view of how complex is these mechanisms in us, how multi-layered how dynamic, because I might trust David today, but not tomorrow if he doesn't give me another piece of information that I expected him to give. So it, it's so, so multi-layered, it, it, it's so dynamic, it's so complex. You know, don't forget that in these small towns, you might be my competitor. At the end, we might be selling to the same global distributors, but we will exchange strategic information. So it's very bizarre but also wonderful. And this is why the cities, of course, China has a lot of these uh, locations, um, 
now and, and other parts so did you did you focus on how the local like entrepreneurs interacted and how that influenced their interaction with the outside world excellent yes ah, okay so if you consider these localities uh, as a regional phenomenon really geographical phenomenon a specific geography you have external information coming in mm -hmm. and internal information coming out and yeah. of course what's happening within the system mm -hmm. so yes you are completely right how information comes in how this information is processed and disseminated and then how this leads to actions that they have an output now the output could be information the output could be a product the output yeah. could be a shipment of goods going somewhere <laughs> so yes there is input process and output so you you must have a, a very good idea of what it takes for a consumer even if that's like a business not a business to trust someone like i can imagine right because you Absolutely. you mentioned um how what what makes us believe other people misinformation so what are like the how does what factors are like are important to trust someone especially in business so this is a fantastic question and maybe it is also the right segue to what i'm doing today with applying neuroscience in business yeah, yeah. you know that nothing happens in va in a vacuum mm -hmm. so it's not that somehow a completely new person appeared in front of me from a completely uh, new medium expressing a completely new idea with no relation to other ideas whatsoever. This <laughs> rarely or never happens. So the person, the medium, and the message, what is the content of the information, uh, when it enters our brains, uh, the, uh, what we do is that a lot of associative uh, thinking happens to see how what I see, read, or, 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 or watch now uh, relates to things that I already know. This is why there is a, there is a stock market of trust. Trust is like a share with a value, can go up or can go down. My trust in you or a business partner can be high one moment, can be low another moment. A trust to a theory or to a piece of information can be high. No, so, so we constantly reevaluate based on the outcomes. If I trusted a piece of information that has proven to be wrong and I felt the pain, the disappointment, the embarrassment, right, of believing something that is not right is input to have a better prediction next time which means that next time i will hear a piece of information from the same person will actually not give it so much value so there is there is a very long-term process for developing trust this was one of the things that fascinated me in the very early stages of my phd of my research where i embraced fully theories from psychology as a science um, and what i realized is two things about about uh, trust first but as i said trust trust has stages so you have to pass through some stages of trust in order for somebody to say i trust you so it's not one you know off on it's a, it's a process yeah. and the second thing that uh, fascinated me and it is one of the best definitions of trust I've ever heard or read, is that actually, if you think about it, trust is about, if I trust you, trust is about being open by decision, being open to the possibility that you harm me. Oh, yeah. It's a risk. It's a risk. In what way? Let's say uh, I go to the to a group of people and I say to everybody, okay, give me, I don't know, 100 euros each one and because I, I found some new <laughs> cryptocurrency and, and then I can get this money and disappear. So what is trust? By giving me this money, you are actually, you are willing to take the risk of uh, a negative return. And this is trust. And this is why what will actually happen 
will form the feedback loop that will teach me if I was correct to take the risk or not. However, I have to, to point out, especially in social media, um, uh, there were some studies that were showing that, um, and I, I kind of expected this because we mentioned a, a similar study in my first book, Neuroscience for Leaders. So in Neuroscience for, for Leaders, we were very really interested with my co-author to see how change happens in organizations, of course, through the lenses of neuroscience. And one of the interesting things that we found out is that in order for a change to happen in an organization and people to willingly change their habits, their the way that they behave, the way that they interact with each other, it doesn't happen overnight. You need to prepare them in advance so to increase the preparation level of the population to a minimum level where the, the um, request to change will be accepted. If you don't do this pre-work, regardless how much, what kind of persuasion I use, what kind of numbers I use, what kind of uh, information I attack, if, if you are not already there to accept it, you will most probably reject it. And this is now what many studies found in um, during lockdowns in Corona, but also now. They found out that regardless how many conspiracy theories might appear in your feed, regardless how much um, questionable uh, information or data or theories will be present for you to notice, you will not click on them unless you were already already interested in them. Mm-hmm. That's, That's interesting. That's interesting because it actually yeah. proves, disproves, this is better, disproves that you can really manipulate the population fast and, uh, and brainwash people. No, no, no. People that were not into conspiracy theories or extreme theories or you know, this kind of hate groups, regardless how much the algorithm tried to allure them, the, it's all, always, we have to talk probabilistically, right? With yeah. the, the probability for them to click, it was extremely low. However, if you already have clicked sometimes before, so you already are yeah. halfway there. Or saw some uh, tweets or like content right. and it's not, you, you were not wrote, convinced. Yes, if you watched something already on YouTube, so if, yeah. if you already did the preparatory work to be there, then it works fantastically. Wait, so I just thought of something. So I can can compare this to... uh, So you're basically saying that the impact is lower if you um, reduce the force of what what you want to convince someone of. So imagine that you want to open like a, a water valve. If you open it really quickly the impact and the stream of the water is very high and you might have like a reaction, oh, there's water coming out. But if you do it very slowly, it will come to the same point of pressure, but you won't notice it because it was slow. Something like that, right? So um, this, is the, this is the traditional th- uh, approach of the... Um, of uh, how, how, how can I describe it? So there is this um, urban legend um, that if you put a frog in a cooking pot with water, if the water is, have you heard of this? If the water yes. is too, it's boiling, of course the frog will jump out. Mm-hmm. But if if you slowly increase, you the, will not notice it. They will also in the end. Okay, uh, actually no. Uh, regardless of if you uh, put the the tap fastly for a lot of water to run or little if i don't click even in the little it will not work so what i'm trying to to actually describe is that if you do not have an internal motivation or inclination or fascination to this topic regardless how strong or weak will be the pressure of the water you will not click so yep. we are not, our brain is not fooled as easily as, as some people want to believe. Yes, it I has think. It's own, you know, things it wants to do. Yeah. And also, 
since you mentioned like um, conspiracy theories um, and trust, what what comes to mind is that trust is kind of like validation. You have like a, some kind of a preconceived idea of something. And then everything, every piece of information that comes in into your mind is validated. Like it's put on the other side of what you think it is. It is it's true or not. And then I think this validation process over time turns into trust. And right. you, you also mentioned like uh, cryptocurrencies, and which is f- quite funny. The main tenant, like the main tenant of um, of Bitcoin, is verified on trust because it's based on verification and crypto cryptology or crypt, cryptography or how's it called? It's based on verification over trust. So, do you think it's possible to verify and of trust, or is it already verification? Right. Right. So in, in business theory, there is something that is called um, uh, transaction costs. Yeah. A transaction cost is what? Is, uh, let's say we, um, I find you online and you are selling some service and uh, yeah. I want to buy. If trust is not there, transaction costs are high. What is transaction cost? The effort, yeah. the money and the time I have to put to protect myself of possible harm from you in the process of working together. So, of course, we will work together, but my lawyer has to prepare a contract and give it to your Mm. lawyer. Then we have to agree. Then we have to give a little bit of business to each other. So there is a lot of, um, somebody will say investing, investing the effort, somebody will say losing the time in order to reach that level with the verifications. So... To open a little bit myself to harm, you not to harm me, uh, so there is a, a, a validation that you will not harm me, to do it again again, as we said, as a process, and then trust to be. But don't forget that trust can be lost overnight. You build mm-hmm. it over a long period of time, but you lose it o- o- over time. So um, what also I think it happens with cryptocurrencies is that, uh, of course, maybe, maybe I haven't heard it before, maybe the motto is... Uh, verified on trust but if i very the process of verification is demanding effort from me is losing time and attracts my attention to maybe somewhere else that my attention would be more productive so of course in the beginning i will verify verify but if i have 10 verifications validations over 10 consecutive trials and they are all positive then I will bet that the 11th would also be positive and maybe I will not verify. Actually, this is what con artists do. Mm-hmm. You know, con artists, con comes from confidence because they build the confidence. Yeah. Con artists exactly know that you will trust me more if I interact with you multiple times and every time I confirm that I'm trustworthy. So the 11th time where you will say that, okay, it's enough, I don't have to spend so much... To have so high transaction costs, I can lower my transaction costs and give you more space to harm me because you haven't done it the last 10 times. So I bet you will not do it the 11th, but it's the 11th. <laughs> and they mm-hmm. will do it and they will steal all the so money. It's, so it's like give, 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 and then take. That's what con artists do. do. And I think that, uh, you know, from Netflix series to, to movies, this is, the, this is why... Um, uh, this, uh, but on the other hand, I mean, trust is a big issue, but also what we have uh, evolved as a species, what we do, do to people that harm repetitively people of our tribe. You know why con artists exist? Because we, we, we live in huge anonymous societies. In small tribal groups, when we were evolving, where everybody knew each other and interacted Mm -hmm. every day by face, by voice, by everything, if you were repeatedly harming others and, you know, um, destroying their trust, transaction costs were so high to keep you in the the risk to keep you that, as many people say, (laughs) they took you for a walk in the the forest and they came back without you, you know. (laughs) There there is 
there, are, there were mechanisms to protect us, evolutionary speaking, by such cases. Unfortunately, in modern society, and especially in social media, where I can have 20 accounts with pseudonyms, mm-hmm. you know, I yeah, can that's... have, uh, I don't know, um, ACDC 1003. It can be anyone. Yeah. It can be anyone. And, and, and this is this is now interesting in both sides. Not only can be a, a, anyone in order to fool you, but also if I don't want to fool you, this is this is fascinating. Even if I don't have as an intention to fool you, the fact that I'm not with there with my own name, identity, and characteristics that you can trace me back to who I am, my brain switches off some of the some of the. Um, Uh, protocols that it's using in order to maybe inhibit, inhibit is to stop yeah. some of my antisocial behavior. So, of oh, course, wow. if, you, if you are in a company with your friends, you know, outside, or if you're in your business with your colleagues, maybe you have some strange or, or crazy ideas, but you have the ability to inhibit them, to stop them, because you want to have a social cohesion yeah. and to collaborate and not to lose face, eh? not to lose face. There's When consequences. I- There's cons- Bravo, there's cons- mm-hmm. When I go online and I have a, a pseudonym that means nothing, it's like, a, it's like I'm drunk, it's like I'm a kid. And my prefrontal cortex that usually is the guardian for this kind of, um, of uh, antisocial or, or excessive behavior is not applying its power. So I find it easier. I'm more impulsive. I can say... I can go online and, and be very bad towards somebody else without feeling the normal emotions of remorse, of mm-hmm. embarrassment, of empathy. Mm-hmm. How can I It's, feel empathy yeah. without a name? It's dehumanizing. Yeah, that's true. Exactly. And you know what's interesting? The You can apply this to business as well. Uh, for instance, on Twitter or now X, you see that people, there's a lot of faceless accounts that that basically are companies and people that are um, giving value on some topic. It doesn't matter what it is, but the fact that they're faceless and they are just standing for an idea makes it far easier for me to trust that person than if it was a person. Like if it, if it said like uh, um, Dr. Nikolaos, um, I, I share information about history. You're like, Oh yes, who is this guy? And then you, you you're, inhibitors start working like do i trust this guy and uh, is he trustworthy but if it just if it just says like some troll picture of like um good good joseph stalin you immediately drop your guard and you're like oh this is funny this is interesting i might follow this but the funny thing is it's also a person so i think that this is being used to like have a business advantage these days True. Don't forget, we use uh, proxies also as personalities, uh, companies, logos, a logo yes. of a company. Yeah. And, and you know what is amazing is that um, our brains use the same networks that we use to evaluate humans, fellow humans, to evaluate companies. Or, yeah. or as you said, um, a branded personalities online that you don't know the actual person, but mm-hmm. they have maybe a funny... A, a funny um, um, idea or a name or an idea, yeah. as you said. We don't have uh, we, bre- branding in corporations as a phenomenon is a hundred plus years old phenomenon, you know, maybe 200 years. Uh, we didn't develop a new structure in the brain. So actually, actually, my brain will try to see, hmm, is this person here to damage me to harm me or this person has my well-being in their intentions this is called war- warmth by the way this is a, fa- a very famous social cognition model of, a- of evaluating each other which uh, talks about two main criteria warmth and competence mm-hmm. and the brain very fast in milliseconds below a second will always when i see somebody but also a company or or um or a, um, a, a website with you know funny memes, immediately will apply this criteria. Is it warm? Will it make me laugh? That means warm. <laughs> yeah. And is it competent? Does it say better jokes than somebody else? And 
and we do this analytics constantly, not on once, not only the first time I will see you, every second the brain receives feedback on the prediction that it does, because it does a prediction, hmm, I will laugh. If you don't make me laugh, we'll make maybe one more, if I have a good uh, history, maybe back. Then if you don't make me laugh five times, then it drops your score of competence. It says, okay, it's a, it's a good sight, but I'm not receiving the pleasure I was receiving before. Let me maybe find another one. Mm-hmm. Okay. So it's like a yes. hierarchy of a, of a balance between competence and warmth. So kind of trust in you as a person and the lowest amount of risk attached to that competence. So I would say that uh, risk is more about warmth in what, in what sense? Imagine I'm in, we are cave people, right? So we, mm-hmm. imagine we are back uh, a few tens of thousands of, of years. And You're still I, cave people sometimes, so it's yeah, fine. Always, <laughs> <laughs> in your social media. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Although I think that uh, we give a very bad rap to cave people. They were much more, um, in, 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 a, in a humane way, they were actually very, very advanced, probably more than what we, mm-hmm. we want to give. I can them. imagine, yeah. Yeah, the things that we discuss, trust, etc. I think, I think they were they were quite advanced. But um, so so let's say I come back out of my, out mm-hmm. my cave and I see you for the first time. I never saw you eh, before. You are not from my tribe. You are not from the neighboring tribe. Never seen you before. Now I my my brain has to calculate my unconscious mind very fast. The first thing, not if you are a good hunter or not, or if you are a good warrior or not. That comes second. First, I have to decide, is this cave person that I've never seen before here to kill me or to help me? (laughs) So the first decision is the decision of risk. Because if I decide competence first, this might take two seconds, and the two seconds is the two seconds that you need to to beat me up or Mm -hmm. kill me with your axe. So first, first priority has warmth, which is actually about tra- trust of intentions. Let's call them in- intentionality trust. Are your intentions good or bad towards me? Mm-hmm. And then I will measure you, measure you up and down and say, hey, his intentions are bad. So we lock this in. <laughs> you know, this is locked in yes. the algorithm. He your doesn't kill me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you, you came here to kill me. Let's, <laughs> let's, take, the, let's take the negative scenario, the worst scenario. So he's here to kill me. How? Because he's full of blood, he's looking like this, he's, you know, um, <laughs> ready to... Okay, and then I have very fast to decide. Is he better than me in fighting? And now the second decision is fight or flight, right? If you are better, I have to run. If, if you are not better, I have to engage. But this is the second decision. So the, fir- so the first is trust of intentionality. Okay, so intentionality... If you have warmth, this is where it's trust. If you is uh, low warmth, it's not trust. And then it's, okay, now that I established that you are here to help me, if I take you hunting with me and you are not a good hunter and you get us all killed, then, I, okay, I like you, you like me, we are warm to each other, but stay back. We are going to hunt. Mm-hmm. The, of course, the best, the best case scenario is if, if you portray warmth, and also high competence. Then I will follow you. You go to battle, I come with you. Uh, you go to hunt, I come with you. Uh, it's admiration, it's attraction, it's magnetism. People that have high warmth and high competence are, are, are we call them socially <laughs> magnetic people, you know, with high social magnetism. Uh, so are those type of people also the, the type of people that are like most likely to be hyper successful on social media? I think if we also assign them other characteristics as well, uh, for example, I think that um, um, extro extroversion, so extrovert mm-hmm. versus introvert people, or the way that you communicate emotions. So there is some and another also. Uh, there there are also elements of communication mm-hmm. uh, and the, your ability to to inspire or to or to convey a message in a in a way that it is relatable, mm-hmm. but also profound. Not only somebody has to say something important, but at it has the a same meaning. Time, 
a to, deep meaning. To talk to you, yeah. To, so again, not to be in a vacuum, to come to something that you are already uh, are interested or you have already started a journey. Of, of course, um, people with high warmth and high competence can be a very quiet people. They can be people that are, uh, you know, you wouldn't say that are are the ones shouting. But uh, the moment that you I will feel warmth, imagine in an office. So I'm new one. I come to this the business, I'm new. And I realize that a colleague of mine comes to help me. New they don't know me, but immediately they offer their help. They help me navigate these very difficult first days at work. They support me, they own board. Yeah. But they're also fantastic in what they do. People say, wow. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I want to spend more time with this person. It's, it's uh, only natural. Yeah, maybe that's actually, I think that this phenomenon is also the reason why we're having this podcast. Because when we when we met on the, the well-being event and you had to speak there, um, I felt like you were very open and authentic in what you did. And I felt like a connection because... I felt a warmth and I felt that you were good at what you do. So that's interesting. You're that type of person. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, David. I, I, I think that, I mean, as you now, as, as somebody that started the podcast and started um, your own business. Uh, starting, starting. Start, We're still yes, trying start, to. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Uh, we, which I wish you all, all the best. And I'm, of Thank course, you. I'm to support you as, as I am today. Um, you will find out that. Um, Passion, drive, resilience in terms of finding the strength and the energy to come back from a big blow, which will be very often. Um, I know this. The difference. Yeah, what makes the difference? Because I have full confidence that concerning um, competence, you will do your best, you know, from your studies to your trainings to you are a very curious person. So you look around, you discuss. I mean, you came to discuss with me at the event, you search. You, you you are one of the very few people that um, when I meet in the events, you threw a few names in that that really impressed me that you are you are doing your homework. So this part is, is there, but you will see that sometimes is um, the game is played in, in, in pure willpower to just yeah. um, get up in the morning or in mm-hmm. the evening when you think you finished and you get three emails that are very important and although tired, you stay a little bit more. So th- these, th- these things are important. And I think th- this is what this social cognition model, apart from explain, hey, and by the way, to give you some numbers, social cognition model explains 80% of our social behavior and it is verified in more than 60 countries. So here we're talking about a human universal, not some kind of, localized theory Mm -hmm. no it has to do with who we are as humans you know if aliens uh, came to earth and said who are these people they would find world and competence of course different cultures different countries maybe they apply it different but it's there and this is why it's fascinating but apart from explaining how we interact i think it also explains how to do business Um, you know that google uh, implemented the warmth and competence model as somebody told me in one of the events where um, if you spend a year with a colleague, they will ask you, would you like to spend more time with this colleague, which is warm? Mm-hmm. And did this colleague improve in their technical skills over the last year? So Confidence. they apply the competence. Yeah, exactly. Competence. Mm-hmm. Really, it's a very powerful tool. But it also, I think, describes us that we have this energy, this power, this passion but also we need to be extremely good in the technical aspects of what we do. That's really interesting because if you think about it more deeply, it comes back in everything that we do as humans. Because like, for instance, even the words, like how do you as like someone who applies neuroscience, how do you explain the word vibe? Because we use this a lot these days. This guy has this kind of vibe. He attracts me. Um, I'm attracted to his vibe. Like, how do you explain this? The energy. Yeah, I hear it from my daughter a lot. <laughs> <laughs> of, course. My daughter and of course. And, and because she's using it, now we are all using it. We have yes. to also... <laughs> uh, it's only natural to, to you know, exchange uh, type of wording and, and keyword buzzwords. 
Um, first of all, I think that uh, we live in a society because of uh, social media and in this 24-hour news cycle mm-hmm. um, and this um, uh, overpowering amount of information where for our brains to notice things, they need to be stronger than before. It's like if you start eating spicy food. In the beginning, even the food that is a little bit spicy, it will feel, you know, biting. It will feel maybe a little bit of pain. But the more you do it, the more you will adapt to it. And in order to really feel the excitement of the heat, you will upgrade and then you will upgrade. I think the same has happened observing my daughter and young generations is that we are upgrading the wording uh, in order to, because we adapt in one level of emotional life and now because of much stronger emotional messages, uh, what, I, what I mean, you are on, uh, let's say, on TikTok or in, uh, you watch uh, shorts or reels or stories. Mm-hmm. You have one story where somebody falls down and has an accident. Really, they have car accidents. You have images of war, you know, with the fire. And then you have, you know, um, somebody saving a dog from, you know, from an from a overflown river. Mm-hmm. Within... 35 seconds, all the stories. So imagine our poor brain being attacked from extremely emotionally demanding information in such a short period of time, all the time. How can it uh, deal with all this without going crazy? There's a very nice term in, in um, psychology called adaptation that our, our, our brain changes. It's, it's called homeostatic uh, levels. So the levels that it considered normal for continuing life and it adjusting these levels in order to have, let's say, a functional, a functional um, uh, mental and emotional um, um, state you know, and behaviors. So if we are attacked by emotions all the time now and, and conflicting emotions, one is happy, the other is... Uh, is uh, negative, the other is funny, the other is disgusting, the other... How many emotions these poor kids per day? So what is the brain going to do? It's going to adapt to that level of emotionality. So in order to, to evoke emotions, you have to go stronger. Oh, yeah. In a sense, mm-hmm. what made me cry in a movie, so sometimes me and my wife, we watch a movie. We'll never. You're jerking, you know, and you... you start, <laughs> and, and my daughter says... What's happening with you? Are you crazy people? <laughs> yeah, this same. Is not, That's for me. Same thing. That's exactly adaptation. And I think words like vibe, because vibe is vibration, right? Mm-hmm. So it's something that really shakes you. Mm-hmm. So it's not like I like, you know, or I find you interesting. This is too weak emotionally to engage young generations. So we have to use stronger words. Like now you vibe, you, your vibe is so strong. You, you pass your energy. Before we would say, I like you. Oh, yeah, that's true. You know? It's also a, a bit of a subconscious feeling. It's more of a feeling, right? Because if you say, I like you, it's very direct. You're communicating what you're, what you're feeling or what you're thinking. But vibe is like, it's a bit more low key to use like more a Gen Z language. But it's very indirect and i think that suits um the like the current generation or my generation because it doesn't need a lot of confrontation to be able to use those words they implicitly right. tell you the meaning like i don't have to tell you oh i like you so much you're so open and funny i can just say i like your vibe and then there is no confrontation needed maybe it's that's, something like that that's very interesting and I think this is also a way that, uh, because we did, we discussed earlier about the negative impact of uh, yeah. anonymity and this fast communication, but we have to admit that there's a lot of positives as well. I'm not yes. a luddite. Eh? I don't want to go and destroy. Social media are fantastic. I'm connecting with people from all around the world. I expand my network. I find new friends. I see things fantastic. So absolutely, we don't want to go to the other extreme. It just is too early. It's too early. Uh, and we still haven't understood how to do it correctly. 
Mm-hmm. I think slowly we will we are moving to the right direction. But absolutely, we need to use it, and we have to use it, and it's fantastic to use it. You just have to we have to use it. You have to more. own it. Like it's very simple. Exactly. It takes time. With any new invention, horrible things happen first. I imagine that when the car was invented, a lot of people died because right. it was simply garbage technology in the beginning. But now we all drive cars and it's safe. And they didn't know how to drive. And yes, this is the beginning. It's le- legislation. Yes, as well. Legislation is late to adapt. Yep, obviously. So I, yes, so I, so I, businesses take over. The, so I hope mm-hmm. legislation will at least not kill innovation, but a little bit uh, protect. Uh, but what I was trying to say is that the same with vibe is, for example, emojis. I mean, have you mm-hmm. seen? I mean, you're also a very young person, but I see, you know, sometimes with my daughter how how a message looks like, how yes. a story looks like. It's not a whole sentence. It's not a it's whole emojis. Not whole words. Yes. There are there is new type of communication, and because and this for me, you know, maybe sometimes we are old people shouting at the cloud, the, at the cloud. You know, we we are there is this generational gap, and we don't like. No, I, I find it fascinating. It, to me, is brain adaptability. It shows yes, how yes, flexible, right. how new, <laughs> neuroplasticity works in a fantastic way. We need to to type fast. We will mm-hmm. invent a new type process. Of, yeah, so, and this will happen in order to have more efficient collaboration and co- co- and interaction and cooperation. And it works. You see how fantastic the brain adapted. Mm-hmm. So it, it's amazing. So vibe, as you said, and uh, the the the, sh- the shortened um, shortened words and the emojis and all the other things that uh, are are now explored as new ways of of communication. What are what are the limits of the brain in this regard? Because you mentioned like information overload, uh, emotion overload like just the mind is constantly bombarded with information with this endless feed and by the way interestingly my business right now is about tackling this issue and i focus on entrepreneurs because entrepreneurs are people that solve problems and i actually want to combat the information overwhelm for digital entrepreneurs so this is super interesting for me and i was wondering what is the, the upper limit of adaptation for a brain in this specific context? Like how much information is too much so that the brain just says what's going on? Like, right. This is, I think, uh, you, you very rightly spotted one of the biggest challenges we have. Um, uh, I'm so passionate about this topic that I created, uh, <laughs> I created a startup in Belgium <laughs> where we also, um, the event that we met, I was actually there representing my startup, which is called wellbeing.ai, uh, uh, which was conceived in um, during the lockdowns, where really uh, people were having a hard time adapting so fast and sudden to... Um, all of a sudden, or, or you know, overnight, being locked uh, uh, with at all home. the lockdowns and being locked in at home, in order to have problems in uh, in in finding your own way of working, because they had nothing to do with what you were doing before, and all of a sudden you were at home, maybe with your kids, your dog, your your partner, or with nobody, another new challenge and. I have been using um, neurometrics and biometrics for a long time, especially emotion detecting technology. It's super interesting, by the way. Like, I love it. You showed me the demos. It's so right. nice. I'm, I'm so glad you say this because I was so passionate to bring this technology to companies mm-hmm. because we have been using it uh, for marketing for 15 years, mm-hmm. measuring uh, customer experience and reaction to advertisements and all this. So wellbeing.ai actually is uh, one of the first solutions to apply this technology for people in companies Mm -hmm. in a way that um, we use something very simple, the camera of your laptop, to measure 490 points on your face plus plus your your eye movement in order to determine the levels of mental fatigue. Mental fatigue leads to burnout, right? Mental fatigue is how tired you become cognitively, meaning how efficiently... Uh, you process information mm-hmm. uh, every single second. Uh, and uh, after two years of R&D, in September, we launched the commercial version of the of the uh, product and we're very proud about it. So as you see, I'm, I'm very invested 
in this case. Now, so you asked me about some numbers that the brain receives 11 million bits of information per second from our senses. So the sensory system, the five senses, if we, if we take that model, uh, sends to the brain 11 million bits per second. From this, what appears in what we call conscious mind is only 2 to 60. Yeah. Not 2,000, not 60,000, just 2. <laughs> so 2 to 60 bits seems to be the analytical power of the conscious mind with an upper limit of 120 bits per second. So there is a lot of information that the brain takes in order to do all its unconscious um, processing, associative analytics, and all the other things that it does, in order then for us to be aware, consciously aware of something. So actually what the problem is today is that there is too many things shouting to the brain to notice. Mm -hmm. And it's a bit of, of... Because I'll give you an example. Your, your eyes move to three to five points on your visual field per second. Actually, bravo. Without you knowing it, without you controlling it. So even when you look at me, your eyes every second will be around three to five points in the environment just to check what's happening. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in terms of rounds, it, it does a 500 degrees of a revolution of a spin per second. Of course, it doesn't <laughs> do the whole spin, but if mm -hmm. you add all the movements that it does, it's 500 plus, 510 if I remember correctly, uh, a revolution, uh, de degrees of a revolution per second. This means that your brain is constantly on the lookout for new information. And you can imagine the evolutionary advantage of that, right? Mm -hmm. yes. You walk in the forest, it's I hot. look at you, but it has to notice the snake, that, mm -hmm. uh, regardless where you are focusing. Where you are focusing is not so relevant. What mm -hmm. is relevant is where you are not focusing and there is a danger. Or the peripheral. Yeah. Yes, bravo. bravo. No, no, not even the peripheral. It's, um, it's actually the... the, the, the the eye moves, peripheral is how we consciously experience it, but from the mm. brain's perspective, it just points in the field of vision where it has to jump fast and back yeah. and many times in order to collect data. And to, so uh, it, when you scroll down your, you know, in, in social media and your feed, regardless where you focus, maybe you think you didn't focus on it. Maybe you think that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm 20 minutes scrolling down and I didn't see something important. Why should I be, I be tired? No, no, it's not you. It's your brain, meaning you're also part of your brain, right? You're not outside your, you're also, part, but you're a specific system of your brain. Your brain has other systems as well. The, my brain doesn't have only the system, what Nikos, me, calls myself. The self is a one system. There are many other systems. And these other systems, their role is to analyze this 11 million bits of information that come. And by the way, from the 11 million, 10 million is visual information. So the majority. So it's all visual. this information comes in. You are scrolling down. You think that you didn't notice anything, but your brain like crazy goes all around. Maybe there is something flashy. Maybe there is some movement. Maybe there is uh, some big word that, uh, that attracts. The brain will do its best, as it knows through millennia of evolution, to collect all the possible information. So it makes you tired without you knowing it. Yeah. And you and consciously, you might say, no, I'm fine. But you spend a lot of expensive energy. I'm talking about glucose mm -hmm. and oxygen. Yes. Okay. So you spend it. And then you say, okay, now we'll st study. But you start studying it, you cannot because <laughs> the brain energy, power is, yeah. is, is gone. So if there is so much going on at all times, is the feeling of overwhelm uh, like... Does that happen because we become too conscious of the impulses that we receive? Because if like if there's so much happening, it must be that we're conscious of more than 200, for instance, at one point, and then we get overwhelmed. Is it like this? Or how do we get yeah, overwhelmed? Consciousness is not as important um, here. Hmm. Actually, I would, I would argue that consciousness is not as important generally in life. <laughs> it's not as important as we think. 
uh, there is a huge tidal change. I mean, I'm, I'm saying this for 20 years now, and through my research and through my work, um, you see that what we call conscious mind is not what we traditionally thought that mm -hmm. its its role is. It's not the role that we assigned it traditionally. It plays a role, but there's a big discussion what this role is. But it's not what traditionally. It's about... Now, think of your conscious mind as an expression of your unconscious. Yeah, yeah. An ex a tool. It's a tool it's mm -hmm, a mm -hmm. of the unconscious. Which it creates as a, con as a con consequence of the analytics that it does. Yeah. So it's not the conscious mind that does the analytics and says to the unconscious what to do. It's exactly the opposite. The unconscious yes. does the analytics. Yeah. And then based on this analytics, creates what we call the conscious mind. If the analytics are tiring the brain, consciousness will also not be as efficient and effective and productive because the brain does not have, did not have the enough power, time, mm. and space okay. to be better in what analytics it does. So this is why you will also consciously avoid noticing something that is important because the unconscious missed it because it was too tired or too spent or too, as we call it, as I said, with mental fatigue. And that's the problem. The problem is um, we are, and, and of course, I will not talk because so many people now have uh, discussed the dopamine effect of, so not only there's so much that happens and the brain tries to notice everything and absorb the information and analyze it, which makes it spend its energy anyhow, but also you have the excitement of the brain. Oh, let's see also this. Let me see the next, which also is tiring because you spend more dopamine and mm -hmm. of course dopamine takes time to, re to replenish and you also this adds to the even more to the tiredness. So there's a multiple effect. But as I said, this dopamine effect, everybody <laughs> is talking about. So I will Talks about, it. yeah. So, so you, you see, and, and you know how, how our attention works. Our attention works as a monkey on a tree with bananas <laughs> and, and maybe I'm focusing on this because it gives me a lot of bananas a reward that I notice it so I invest my attention which is the monkey on that tree in order to change my attention my brain will decide how far is this other tree and how many bananas it has hmm. so if you shout to me and say hey I'm here, I'm the tree with the bananas, now notice me, 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 I have a new podcast, I have a new post, and then I say, ah, there are bananas, so I will take my attention here, I will go to the other tree, and you tricked me, there's no many bananas there, or they are off, then my brain will say, ah, next time that Nikos will invite me to give him my attention, I didn't get the pleasure that hmm. I predicted, so his tree is not as uh, you know, beneficial to me, so I will punish him by not giving him the attention next time. However, because there are so many flashy things, th your brain and my brain goes from banana tree to another banana tree. And before finishing all the bananas of this tree, jumps another. This is why, <laughs> unfortunately, it's a phenomenon of our times that we buy books and we start to read them. And I think the rate of uh, finishing books is something very small. Huh? Mm -hmm. I don't remember if it is 10, less than 20%, how many books are really finished. Yes. Why? Because you go to a bookstore and you see somebody talk about a book. This is the banana tree. And you say, oh, okay. And then you jump on this banana tree. You start getting the, uh, the bananas by reading it. But then your phone says, hey, I have more bananas banana. here. <laughs> Better watch the podcast. So... <laughs> Let's go to the other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, this is how it works. And, and there is more banana trees with flashy bananas than ever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's the problem. <laughs> so the, the, and it's funny that you say this because I have this rule. I don't buy any more books until I have at least read 70% of my books to completion. Fantastic. So like, I, because I know that people, for instance, with Audible, it's so easy to stack the books, right? To have like 300 books. Uh, but to me, it's like pointless. Why do you want this? Absolutely. You want the books for the knowledge. So read them. Right. So I'm very meticulous on finishing books now. Before, and don't like get me wrong, I still read like 10 books at a time. Like I, I jump between books. 
but I always finish them and I don't buy new ones until I finish them. So maybe the solution is to use your conscious brain to say, I don't want your new bananas right now. Right. Uh, As you said, actually, from a neuroscientific perspective, (coughs) we have to we have to think what will make my conscious mind do this? Mm-hmm. You know what it is? Motivation. Yeah. Emotional motivation. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, even if I, <clears throat> I'm sorry, even if I say I will do it, I will not do it. How many times we say I will start diet on Monday, gym on Monday, and we don't because the mm-hmm. conscious mind does not give orders. That's true. Say whatever you want with your conscious mind. I will learn a new language. I will uh, start playing my guitar again. I will learn whatever you say. If there is no deeper unconscious motivation, there is no decision that ever conscious mind can can impose to the body. This is not, not how we work. This is not how humans work it's it's an illusion it's not top down you don't say to the body what the body will do the body will tell you it knows already before you realize that it knows and then it will use consciousness to achieve it better but the consciousness will just say stories it says stories every day but uh, what you said is it's very important because at the end of the day we need to follow what is best for our brain and body Mm -hmm. so if this is this is the system you found that works for you we need to find with the right motivation. If this is the best system for me, there's another system for me. But to find a solution, you know, and mm-hmm. solutions can be found by the brain only if the brain feels that there is a problem. Regardless yeah. how much you say theoretically that's a problem, if the brain, if there is some unconscious parts, does not consider this as a pain, it will not engage into problem solving. Because problem solving is not a mathematical equation. It's an action in life to take me from pain to a better homeostatic, you know, Mm -hmm. state as we said before. If I don't feel pain, why should I change? True. So even if I buy many books and I don't read them or I read a little bit, but I'm so happy because I I, I watch the podcast Mm -hmm. and I really don't feel ashamed or there's broke no consequence. because I buy the books <laughs> and all this, the solution will not come. So this is where change happens. And we start a little bit with change. Change happens and great leadership, great leadership, um, great communicators know that in order to induce change, they have to be very direct, transparent and motivating about the personal pain that you feel to which the leader brings a possible way out or the journey, a journey of solution. Yeah. The leader is not here to give solutions. The mm-hmm. le- leadership is about taking to the de- journey, yeah. leading the way. In the end, you have to walk the way, but yes, a guide. The way, right? I cannot walk for you. You have to go from point A to point B. But to motivate you and take you there, um, is leadership. And, and this is why great leaders, first of all, our, our brains look for great leaders when they feel the most pain. If you're mm-hmm. happy, you don't need a leader. You know what you need? A manager. <laughs> <laughs> you need a manager. Yeah. If everything is fine, just a reallocation of resources and coordination. Um, it, but, and, and we have more problems than ever. Eh? We have more problems than ever. Yes, that's, national, that's why... National, yeah. Financial regional, political, wars. This is why we need stronger leaders. Than and entrepreneurs ever. as well. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, they're also leaders, right? We need, we need, we need, we need. Um, I'm, I'm not very positive uh, for the next couple of decades. Actually, a couple yeah, of decades. <laughs> I don't know. I don't have a crystal ball, but <laughs> you know, if you, if, in September 2020, September 2020, mm-hmm. I wrote an article for, on LinkedIn called the crisis mindset for the new normal. There, somehow my unconscious mind figured out, predicted, felt 
that especially the Western world will start, will stop its positive beneficial growth with ups and downs, but growth, and we enter a multiple level crisis period that will make us feel worse for some time. Now, this is one of, of my predictions that I'm unfortunately, unfortunately, were proven correct. And if you read the article, you will see that, of course, I cannot, I could not predict what would happen. It was before the wars, the war in uh, Ukraine and Russia, before the current uh, war, before, before the collapse of the supply uh, system, before inflation. It was before all this, a little bit the start of some of these things. But I said, something is wrong. It's like we finish a golden cycle after Second World War, especially after the fall of the Iron Curtain, where the whole world started globalizing and, become, and we are entering a period where pain hard times. Drink, huh? pain, hard, hard times. times. Hard times. Mm-hmm. And, and we need leaders more than ever. To be, yeah. I, I believe that with great leadership, um, not only we will get out, but we'll be even better because mm-hmm. humanity found the best solutions when we were in our wars. Yeah. So I said it's I'm the... not positive, but I'm very pessimistic for human race. Whenever yeah. there are big problems, we come up with the best solutions that benefit generations to come. I hope mm-hmm. this will not happen to the expense of lives and, uh, and the current times. But uh, hard times uh, has proven that brings out... And if you read uh, even a lot of sociological and psychological studies, uh, the, the, the highest trust <laughs> to, to, to finish how we started, high levels of trust, high levels of support, high levels of warmth happen when we help each other, when we help yep. each other in the worst times. So it reminds me of the thing, the, the little um, square. It's like hard times create like strong men, strong men create like easy times, easy times create weak men, and weak men create hard times, and the cycle repeats itself. So we kind of need, we need hard times. Uh, well, one of my big insights studying neuroscience the last, as I said, almost 20 years, is that the brain needs pain yes. to do stuff. Yes, if you wake I've up learned in this. the morning and everything is solved, you feel, you, you feel without a purpose. You mm-hmm. feel without a strong a, a strong aim to strive towards. And, and you know, this is why I, I, I'm not a big supporter of this circle that you said, because uh, even in, 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 good, in good times, it's not that we have weak humans, mm-hmm. it's that we have very strong humans, but on the wrong direction. Uh, that's, because yeah, they that's... Are create the problem. It's mm-hmm. the wrong leader. It's the wrong purpose. It's yeah. the wrong... Uh, it's the wrong... Uh, uh, idea that will connect us to go out on the street on the street and fight each other the, uh, it needs strength and bravery to do this it's not weak it's very strong but in mm-hmm. the in a destructive direction and then this is why it, it, it's the purpose that changes it changes uh, and and this is why new generations for example you have new generations that let's say we solved some issues after second world war right in the western world we solved some issues, we had growth. Of course, we didn't solve all the issues, there are still many issues to solve. But you see new generations being too loud, maybe, for things that you say, hey, but this is already solved. Why are you so angry? But they have to be angry. Otherwise, why they should get up in the morning? What kind of dreams and hopes? So, I'm sorry to say, but when there are no problems, the brain will create its own problems to find a solution and find purpose and strength to live. And this is something wow. we have to face. And this is why we have to channel this. We have to find productive ways to channel this. Otherwise, it will be channeled in a destructive way. Well, that's actually very profound because that explains why people these days create problems. Like they, they're so like obsessed with this giant... like illusion of an enemy that's not there but that's that's what they need and you, do you think do you think this, this is my last question because we don't have much time left do you think that humans because we will c- 
continue to become more comfortable in life. Technology will help us become more comfortable. Um, and since we need pain to have purpose, do you think that we will strive towards an illusion instead of real life? Maybe, maybe Because otherwise whole, I don't see... Yes. Maybe our whole life is an illusion concerning our conscious yes. understanding. Uh, but this doesn't mean... Um, there is a difference between illusions and delusions. Mm -hmm. Delusions are harmful uh, by nature, by default. Illusions can be helpful. Yes, of course. So can be beneficial. Mm -hmm. um, I was reading the other day, I was reminded, one of my favorite authors is um, uh, Nikos Kazantzakis. Maybe you've heard The Last Temptation of Christ? Yes, yes. Okay, so or Zorba the Greek, he was the author behind all this, and he was very extremely philosophical and a deep thinker about human nature. And, and one he said, one of his most famous quotes, which I really, really love, is that um, uh, we, we, are, we come, we are created, we, we, are, we are arriving from darkness, and we end up in deep darkness the light period in between, we call it life. <laughs> and, it's, and it's really, really so amazing to think like this because it motivates me deeply mm -hmm. not to look to um, delusionary, not illusionary, delusionary <laughs> solutions that create more problems, but to make of this light the best we can for each other. Mm -hmm. Pain is great. For example, when pain is um, fighting cancer, that's a fantastic pain to fight for. Stop wars. It's a fantastic pain to um, improve the environment. It's a fantastic pain. So we do have great pains to connect us. The problem is, is that when these pains are misguided um, accidentally or unfortunately on purpose because of personal gains. Mm -hmm. And and I think that I think that as species we cannot avoid this. Our history is clear. It's clear. We cannot avoid this. But I think that as I said, if if a big crisis, existential crisis happens, I hope that, and I have belief, looking at human history, that uh, maybe we will fall, but the way that we stand up will make us even taller. Yeah, I can see that because the deeper you fall, the higher the rise will be. That's consistent in life. That's beautiful to end with. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for the, David. the insights and the lovely conversation. I wish we could continue to talk because I could go on for hours. Like it's interesting. Let's make um, a part two whenever ready. Yes, yes. Let's do this I really again enjoyed it as well. Let's make. <laughs> yes, let's do it again when you have time. When you uh, when we manage to to find ourselves again. Um, yeah, it took us but, some time, eh, with all our travels. Yes, uh, but meanwhile, uh, maybe you can tell you can promote some of your books or something. Where can people find you? Like what social media sure, platform? I mean, uh, on LinkedIn, uh, they, uh, please connect with me. I post such uh, such issues, all studies. Or, or projects that I have with my neuro labs and my mm -hmm. um, uh, my colleagues. Uh, I wrote two. I co-authored two books: um, Neuroscience for Leaders, already available in seven languages, and Advanced Marketing Management, where we discuss a lot of neuroscience and psychology decisions. To read it. Of how to run a run a, a customer-centric business. <laughs> it's not only for marketeers. Mm -hmm. um, uh, now with uh, with uh, colleagues of, of ours we are asked to compile the very first ever encyclopedia of uh, neuroscience in management it will be ready in two years <laughs> but we started uh, <laughs> compiling it it is really yes. a massive piece of work and uh, also I have uh, quite a few speeches and podcasts on YouTube feel mm -hmm. free to search me up I have also my channel and I will be glad to connect with everybody and uh, um, continue discussing these issues, but most importantly, helping each other and, and motivating each other. Because just discussing is the beginning, right? But mm -hmm. it's motivating and helping each other to achieve better 
things not only for us but for everybody. So thank you so much, David, for having me. No problem. Thank you. And also, also check out uh, wellbeing.ai, your new company. It's really interesting technology. Um, so I'm, I'm looking forward to the developments of that. Um, and I'm probably going to use it whenever I can. So um, yeah, thanks, man. Thank um, you so much. And until next time. Bye, guys.